Hello, thank you for joining us. You have uh, joined the Fairhaven lecture series for spring. I am Carrie Bourne. I'm from the Office of Continuing Education at UW Whitewater. And we host the Fairhaven Lecture Series and have been hosting it um, since 1983. Uh, we usually um, find ourselves at Fairhaven Senior Services in Whitewater, but for the past year, we are holding our lectures virtually. Um, so today we're having uh, the live lecture, but we're recording it and it will be um, aired at Fairhaven Senior Services in a few days. So those of you who are joining us live, please use the chat feature in the right hand corner of your screen and you can enter your questions there anytime. We will um, have the presentation first and then we will go through any Q&A afterwards. So please just enter your questions there. Um, but let's go ahead and get started with today's presentation. Dr. Carol Scavati is a professor of marketing at UW Whitewater. Prior to entering academia in 2001, Carol had spent 22 years in the international telecommunications and direct marketing industries. Dr. Scavati teaches the capstone course for marketing majors and the final course students take before graduating with a marketing degree. She also teaches international marketing in the MBA program. Carol is a Fulbright, um, she's a Fulbright scholar, scholar who taught in Germany a few years ago. Oops, I lost that. Okay, sorry, technology. <laughs> um, she is also the coordinator of the university's international business program and the director of the Institute for International Business Collaboration. In 2018, Carol received the Outstanding Marketing Educator Lifetime Achievement Award from the Direct Marketing Association and Educational Foundation. In 2020, she received UW Whitewater's WP Roseman Excellence in Teaching Award. Please welcome Dr. Carol Scavati that introduction and one of the interesting things that we were talking about just a little bit earlier was that um actually i was probably the first one to do a fairhaven lecture from uh in, in a virtual environment way back in 2012 when uh, i was doing a fulbright in germany i um gave a presentation on the election that was going on so uh, this is kind of coming home. So uh, as, oh, hang on just a second. Technology, let's uh, get to the share of the screen. Here we go. Share, and let's go here. All right. So what I would like to do today is talk a little bit about a trip to Thailand that I made uh, just prior to the travel shutdown. I had the, the opportunity to be in Thailand and other countries in Southeast Asia at the end of 2019, beginning of uh, 2020, and uh, just an amazing trip that even for an experienced traveler like myself, there is nothing better than going someplace you've never been before and experiencing the sights and the peculiarities uh, of that particular country. So let me share a little bit about that trip to Thailand. First of all, as, as Carrie mentioned, I am the director of the Institute for International Business Collaboration here at UW Whitewater in the College of Business. And what we do is we work with our partner schools all over the globe. And those relationships are, we build collaborations, collaborations that happen in the classroom, collaborations that happen extracurricular, sending students abroad, trying to help them improve their intercultural competencies. So that's the foundation of this trip. The, the trip was for the Institute for International Collaboration. And over the past two or three years, the Institute has had quite a bit of work that we've been doing in Thailand. 
specifically with two universities there that are partner schools. Assumption University that's in Bangkok and Mei Fa Long University that's in Chiang Rai, Thailand. Two totally different universities in two totally different parts of the country. And what an amazing experience it was. These collaborations that students do, they do it as part of their courses. And these are just a couple of photos of our students here at Whitewater who are collaborating with students in Thailand on a business case. And they're doing an assignment for their class. And the Thai students are doing an assignment for their class. They just happen to share the same assignment. Well, as you can well imagine, it takes a tremendous amount of coordination to be able to put these things together. And although the students are working virtually, nothing beats being there with the people you're trying to collaborate with, trying to, to uh, find opportunities. So this is really what prompted the trip to Thailand. So since I couldn't do any more here, I hopped on a plane and headed to Bangkok. Now, I tip uh, Bangkok. Bangkok was the starting point of my journey, but there were a lot of other stops, uh, stops along the way. Chiang Rai to visit our partner school, Mei Fa Long, and then some traveling and tourism going up to the Golden Triangle, going to Chiang Mai, and then way south down in Pang Na and Phuket. To give you an idea of the size of Thailand, I've done this overlay of the Thai map uh, on top of the Eastern United States. So if you, if you take a look here, one of the things that you'll find that the far north of Thailand would probably fall around, say, Gaylord, Michigan, while the farthest southern point is around Jacksonville, Florida. What a huge country and tremendously diverse. So when I arrived in Thailand, I got to tell you, a lot of jet lag. But I was hit with just a series of opposites. I saw big skyscrapers, shopping malls that were filled with people. So it had that modern urban look. And simultaneously to this modern urban look was the backdrop of the old Bangkok, of temples, of old buildings, of monuments, the kind of monuments that we never see here in the US. But I also fought, saw this interesting blend of East and West, of modern and ancient. Here's a Starbucks that, uh, that I went to in, um, in Bangkok and the, the style of the building, it looks like a temple. The Ronald McDonald that I saw outside of just about every McDonald's restaurant that you're going to find across Thailand has Ronald McDonald in the position of the traditional Thai greeting. Hands together, slight bow. Yeah, even Ronald McDonald has gone Thai. But you know what? If you need a good old American pizza, Pizza Hut is right there and it's super, super cheap. And the ever-present Coca-Cola. Now you may not be able to read the label. I know I certainly can't read Sanskrit, but just looking at the color and looking at the label, I know for sure that it's a Coke. And it's within an arm's reach away from anyone in the planet. Yeah, Coke has done a great job. But then there's this, this antiquated infrastructure that all this modern 
all these modern buildings are built upon. So around the corner from giant skyscrapers are, are, are utility poles that look like this. And people out on the streets like you wouldn't imagine. We never see crowds on the streets in this capacity really anywhere in this country. Even if you go to Chinatown in San Francisco, there is nothing that duplicates the craziness of what's going on in the streets of Bangkok. So, so many people. But again, modern conveniences and these crazy guys, the tuk-tuk drivers. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with a tuk-tuk. Uh, quite frankly, I wasn't before I went to Thailand and I had my tuk-tuk experiences I can effective, uh, I can say that I did it and I'm glad that I did it and I really don't ever have to do it again. These guys are nuts. They're absolutely crazy. The traffic is tremendous in Bangkok. It's, it's always, always packed. So they have these little vehicles that are built on top of scooters where they can put two people in the back. In this case, it was my husband and I and uh, they're driving around like they would if they were on a scooter, except they have passengers. Um, in the time that I was there, in the five weeks that I was there, I did hear of many, many tuk-tuk accidents because these guys are, are lunatics, but surprisingly enough, nobody really gets hurt. It's amazing. It's like schools of fish out there. They never run into each other. So my first stop, once the jet lag was over, was to Assumption University, our partner school in Thailand. And I, I knew that it was a, a Catholic university. It's actually a Jesuit institution. And, um, but I was kind of surprised to find such a large, magnificent Catholic university when 95% of the people are Buddhists and only 1% are Christians. And again, it was this, this uh, vision of opposites, beautiful, beautiful cathedrals with stained glass windows, but the stained glass windows also happen to mention the, the, the different degrees that the university offers. We didn't even have that back in Marquette. That's pretty cool. But right outside of the cathedral, temples and pagodas, the mix of East and West of modern and ancient. It just kept showing itself in every place, every turn that I made. I also found it very interesting that the universities across Asia, not just in Thailand, but I was told this is pretty much standard across Asia, is that students have a dress code and actually students have uniforms. So these were some, uh, some posters that I found at the graduate school when I was visiting them and saying what is allowed, what isn't allowed. You know, to tell you the truth, I really wish we could implement something like this back here in the US. Then I wouldn't have to look at people in rubber ducky pajamas, but, but that's a different subject. So anyway, dress codes. I mentioned that my husband came with me and usually he doesn't on these business trips, but this was one where we were going to be, or I was going to be away for both Christmas and New Year's because I had business on the front end of Christmas and right after Christmas. So my husband decided that uh, he would come along. Now, what do you do with a guy that is uh, when I'm working, you know, and he has never been to Thailand either. 
So I had an opportunity to give him the Christmas present of a lifetime. I sent him to Thai cooking school while I was working at the university. And I got to tell you, he loved it. And I loved it too. He spent days learning how to make unbelievably delicious Thai meals. And boy, is my mouth watering as we, as I'm speaking to you here. Everything that he made was so good. And, you know, this is kind of the gift that keeps on giving. Because once he came home, I had a chance to have Thai food on a regular basis over this past year. Loved it. Just loved it. Once we finished our time in, in Bangkok, we headed north to Chiang Rai, to Mei Fa Lung University. And I'll tell you more about that in just a moment. But I thought this was an interesting picture to share with you. It's that, that standard, hey, you got visitors at your university. This is a place that has been set up for pictures. But as I looked at how this picture got set up, it reminded me of all the, uh, of how culture impacted the way that we were seated. This was not an arbitrary seating, far from it. It's uh, a more masculine uh, culture and, and very patriarchal, right? So the founding president of the, uh, the university is front and center. And to his, what would that be? That would be to his right is the, um, is the current president. And then some other people that were, were part of the meeting. My colleague, Andy Siganik, he uh, also went with me on this trip. He has uh, the contacts uh, at the different university. But to the left, sitting right next to uh, the founding president is my husband. Now, why is a visitor next to the president of the university? It's age and seniority. It wasn't position. So I thought that was kind of interesting to share. The people in the foreground are the young ones and the people in the background are the old ones. And it was really, it was important for them to structure this that way. Mei Fa Lung, unlike Bangkok, where it's totally crazy on the streets, Mei Fa Lung is up in, in the northern part of China, or China, of Thailand, in the mountains pristine, beautiful, the, the greenest, most luscious part of the world you'll ever see. This was actually the accommodations on the university. It was on university property. And, and this is where we ended up staying while we were in Chiang Rai. Just take a look at this sunrise. I had an opportunity to see this sunrise for almost an entire week. Oh, it was breathtaking, absolutely breathtaking. So Mei Fa Long, she's an important part of this story. She's the woman that you see on the three bot stamp. Mei Fa Long is actually the print or was actually the princess mother. She was um, a commoner that was chosen to be educated, which didn't really happen back in, back in her day. Uh, and she was educated to be a nurse. Well, it just so happened that the crown prince of Siam, as Thailand used to be called, the crown prince uh, was a doctor. He was a physician. And he was up working in the northern part of, China, uh, of Thailand. And his nurse, the one that was assisting him, was Mei Fa Long. They fell in love and they married. Very uncommon 
for royalty to marry a commoner. But she wasn't one to sit on the sidelines. No, far from it. She was extremely active in, in, uh, in politics and really focused on the quality of life for the residents of, of Thailand. Her son, she had two sons and a daughter. The first son, oldest son became king shortly after uh, her husband died early. And the, so the young son, probably in his, I, I can't remember exactly how old he was, but it was probably around that nine, 10, maybe no more than 12 years old. Father dies, he becomes king. But within a couple of years, he ends up passing away. And the younger brother ends up becoming the king. The younger brother and the mother took it upon themselves and really got the government behind them to be able to change the, the entire ecostructure and economy of Northern Thailand, a great feat. So let's talk for a moment about Northern Thailand. And my first stop in Northern Thailand after Chiang Rai was going up to the northernmost point called the Golden Triangle. The intersects the Mekong River, and if any of you spent any time in Vietnam, that's a river that will be uh, that you're definitely going to know about. But here at the point in the Mekong is the intersection of Thailand, of Laos, and Miramar or or Burma. Back in the old days, before Mae Pha Lung and her son the king um, made their, their big changes. The Golden Triangle was known for one product, the white poppy. Now there are about 250, 250 different species of, of poppy. And only the white poppy produces heroin. But boy, did it grow in the mountains. Just take a look at how desolate it looks in the background. It's kind of brown. I mean, the white poppy certainly are beautiful, but but uh, the backdrop looks nothing like it does now. Today, here's what the golden triangle looks like. No more white poppy. Instead, farmers are growing flowers beautiful, magnificent gardens. Boy, I just fell in love with the gardens. And food, food is abundant. I finally got a chance to see a rice plant up close and personal. But what used to be old and desolate and producers of, of heroin are now producing rice and some of the best tea you'll ever find in the world. The other thing that happened in the northern part of the country is that it saw itself as a, a tourist and cultural Mecca. So while on this trip, I had an opportunity to visit a lot of different temples. Here's the giant Buddha in Chiang Rai. She's magnificent. And uh, you can actually take an elevator and go up to her head. And in the middle of her head is a hole. It looks like a ruby from, from the ground. But when you're up there in the hole, you can look over the, the countryside. Just absolutely magnificent. Then there was the Black Temple. The Black Temple, it was eerie, obviously. It was dark. They had all these, these uh, alligators that uh, were, were, were skinned and, and dark, deep woods and, and really strange uh, sculptures. 
the white temple, it glistened in the sun. It has little mirrors all, all over it to make it look even more spectacular. The blue temple, the blue temple, again, another Buddhist temple, another magnificent site. And I gotta tell you, jam packed with tourists. Then for us, it was off to our animal time, which was Christmas on Christmas Eve. On Christmas Eve, we went to Tiger Kingdom and had an opportunity to get up close and personal with this amazingly beautiful beast that you see right here in front of you. Yeah, we got into the area right with the tigers. And I can say and truly mean that yes, I have held a tiger by the tail. Christmas Day, another spectacular experience. And uh, this was the Christmas present that my husband gave to me. So I gave him cooking school. And you know that song, I want a hippopotamus for Christmas? Well, I didn't get a hippopotamus. I got something even bigger. Yes, I got Dodo, the elephant. These, these beasts, 5,000 pounds, that trunk alone, that trunk weighs 400 pounds and has over 40,000 different muscles. The dexterity in the trunk is, is amazing. And actually, if you head over to Roberta's art gallery in the University Center on campus, You'll see a picture of Dodo's trunk there. Uh, I had submitted it for a, we just had a, um, a little contest and uh, a photo exhibit. And uh, go ahead and go see Dodo's trunk up close and personal. Once it was say goodbye to Dodo. And the next thing was to head about a thousand miles south to the sandy beaches of Phuket and Pangna. Now, you may remember in 2004, there was a tsunami that hit Indonesia, it hit Thailand, and a lot of, did a tremendous amount of damage across Southeast Asia. And this was ground zero, if you will, uh, in Thailand. The wall of water that hit the shore was over 38 feet high. So here we have this beautiful, tranquil sea. Can you imagine what it was like to have 30 a 38 foot wall? That's like four stories high, three and a half, four stories high. But I gotta tell you, they rebuilt the infrastructure. Hotels are going back in. It is an absolutely gorgeous place to spend some time. And a couple of side trips along the way, one of which was a longboat out into the bay and seeing these beautiful limestone um, rocks that are sticking out of the, uh, of the sea. And of course, down there, you got to stop off at James Bond Island and take the mandatory picture from, I think it was Goldfinger. I think it was James Bond Goldfinger. So there we are with our, uh, with, the, with the big rock in the background and looking like spies. Well, maybe not. I got to tell you, from the white sandy beaches of the south to Dean and DeLuca and the craziness of the traffic to the north, 
or in Bangkok. Yeah, that was traffic, just normal traffic uh, outside of my hotel. To the beautiful temples in the north. It was an amazing trip. And I'm so glad that we have our partner schools there because that's what caused the trip to happen. Would I go back again? In a heartbeat. So that's what I really wanted to share with you today about the trip to Thailand, the sights and the peculiarities of Thailand. Thank you so much, Dr. Sigavati. That that looks like a trip of a lifetime. I mean, it it's was, just incredible. It was absolutely fantastic. Oh my gosh. I don't know about others who are were watching it, but I'm sitting here behind my screen just smiling at it. Every every photo that came up. It's just amazing. Yeah, I I, I gotta tell you though, it's it, Bangkok was Bangkok is a crazy city. I lived in New York for 17 years, uh, down on 29th Street between 3rd and Lexington. And uh, I thought we had traffic there. I thought there was traffic in Chicago. You ain't seen nothing till you've been to Bangkok. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. That part you probably would be okay to not revisit. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I kind of, it was fun to do the tuk tuk drives we did a, a a couple of those and said okay i think maybe we gotta switch off to to uh they don't have uber there they have grab so but you know one of those ride share kind of things it, you're better off inside a vehicle yeah. with seat belts and right uh, the having the uh, steel I was ready you. to bring my bicycle helmet you know because those oh. people were just so crazy that it, that it's that's crazy. I'm going to remind we have we do have a few people in the audience, and I I'm going to remind them that we will take your questions if you want to enter them into the chat. Sure. Um, you can go ahead and do that, and um, and and we'll take a look, and I'll give them a couple minutes to enter those. Um, and yeah, I have the chat up so I can see if something comes oh, perfect. in. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll ask a question of my own. Um, I'm actually um participating in UW Whitewater's Big Read program, and we're reading mm -hmm. the book, The Late Homecomer, which is a Hmong family memoir. Mm -hmm. And so, um, we're sort of at the part of the book where, um, a Hmong family, they're now uh, they crossed the Mekong River, and are now in Thailand as refugees. And so, I was just wondering, you, you were in that area a little bit, and I was just wondering if, um. You know, if there's any what what what's still there today, you know, if, if anything, um, sort of indicating that these refugees were there or of the war or any of that. I, I know that it isn't Vietnam, but but it did play a role, you know, well, at yeah, least after. Very, very, very much so. Um, actually, you do find pockets of the refugees. The it, it's interesting because the Karen tribe, the ones who are now taking care of the elephants, they are, <laughs> the Karen tribe comes from Burma. Uh, they're part of the Hmong uh, constituency okay. and uh, they've been integrated into it. I am so impressed with what the Karen tribe is doing. This, I, I didn't really get into the details on it, but I learned so much when we went to the elephant sanctuary, because what these what these people have done is they have dedicated their lives to saving abused animals. And uh, I I until I was there, I had no idea about how mistreated these these elephants were. My uh, my my new friend Dodo. The um, the elephant uh, you can go see his picture uh, at the at the art gallery and on campus, but um, he was in logging and he lost a tusk in, in logging. They were beaten, they were bruised, and these are the most social animals that you ever want to see. What the refugees have done is they've decided that they are going to take care of them, and there's. There's uh, all these um, 
uh, foundations that from all over the world that are supporting them. So it was a very positive experience. You know, you think about refugees and you think about awful camps and, and uh, but it may have been happening someplace else, but it sure wasn't happening where I was. They were integrated into, uh, into society and really performing a, a very much needed um, service. That's so interesting. It's kind of, there's, you know, even in the most challenging times, there's opportunities. And so that's, that's really interesting that that's kind of where they went. Yeah, it's um, kind of a, you know, you got lemons, make lemonade. Yeah, and and the whole world is grateful then for, you know, you know, because the elephant population is declining and things like that. And so that's that's wonderful. That's wonderful work. There is a question and it came to me privately. I don't know if you can see it, but um, no, I... the, question, the, the question is, um, what future student collaborations or exchanges or travel programs are you looking at putting together in the future? Oh, gosh. Well, uh, if you're talking about. Well, we actually have 1 more in Thailand, another university that's interested in getting involved with our marketing program. But, um, we're reaching out COVID hit us hard. As it did everybody else once well, I haven't traveled in 14 months and my passport has never collected dust before. So, uh, so this is a, a real new experience for me, but. Um, we're very interested in expanding the network to uh, Kenya. So that's probably going to be our first point in Africa. And uh, other partners, we have partner schools in Costa Rica and Mexico for Central South America. So those, once we're, we're back online and school becomes normal, uh, well, well, as normal as school can be, I think those will be the next places that that we're going to to take these collaborations. I tell you what, we can do them across any discipline. We can do them for an hour and we can do them for a semester and everything in between. So we're really interested in overlaying these collaborative experiences inside the curriculum so students can learn the soft skills that are just so, so difficult to learn. Intercultural competencies. You don't learn it from a book. You learn it by, by talking to somebody. You learn it by making mistakes. Yeah, really good point. So do you have, do the, the faculty and administrators from the partner schools, do they visit Whitewater? Yes, they do. Yes, they do. Um, we have, you know, depending on their budgets, of course, we, <laughs> we, we're hosting uh, people from the Han just about every year. Han is uh, our partner school in um, in the Netherlands, campuses in Arnhem and in Nijmegen. And as a matter of fact, tomorrow there will be tomorrow morning because we have to do these at strange times. We do them either early in the morning or late at night uh, because of time zones, but. Uh, Tomorrow morning, there is a sales negotiation collaboration that will kick off between students in the Netherlands, students here in Whitewater, and students in Minnesota at Winona State University. So it's not just for the partner schools, the foreign partner schools, it's for other universities as well. I would love, Carrie, would love to see this go across UW system. It would be so powerful, yeah. so impactful for student education to do it. Um, there is nothing better than study abroad. When you can send a student to spend four months, five months, six months in a foreign country, they come back a totally different person. Mm -hmm. But let's face it, students don't typically do that. I mean, yeah. we, in the College of Business, I uh, remember, you know, maybe we've got one, two percent of our students who will do that. And, you know, we're the big boys on the block. Yeah. So yeah. Um, how do we do it if we can't get the students to go? We bring it to them. And that's yeah. what the, the Institute is doing. Yeah, that's wonderful. And so, so what business technology uh, or ideas were you able to see in Thailand 
that would be applicable in the future in the US? Was a follow up question there. Business ideas technology that I saw in Thailand. Mm, really off the top of my head, I can't think of uh, some of the, uh, I don't know. I'd have to think about that one. Yeah. Yeah. I'd have to think about that one. But it sounds like the programs aren't even necessarily about the course content as much as they are these other skills that students are are learning that are really? in the books. Yeah, if you're talking about curriculum development, the the curriculum can stay the same. The challenge is getting faculty members in two parts of the world to agree on doing something together. Yeah. And that was why this trip was so important. It's like you can only go so far. You get somebody who takes a taste and you have great success. I mean, we're putting through before COVID, we were putting through between one and 2,000 students going through a collaboration every semester. Wow. Wow. And yeah. Now, not all Whitewater students, mm -hmm. I mean, there were students on the other side too, mm -hmm. but nonetheless, Every single business freshman has a collaborative experience in their very first year. And then we have the disciplines in business. So we have collaboration in finance, uh, where they play a currency game. That's with Mei Fa Long, by the way. Um, we have a collaboration. We have collaborations with the UK, working in management. We have collaborations in economics. We have collaborations in supply chain. We have collaborations, uh, I mentioned finance, supply chain, information technology. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're doing it across the curriculum. So what are the language barriers then as students or, or everybody, you know, what, what, how does that work? The biggest fear of the foreign students is that their English isn't going to be good enough. And the biggest, one of the biggest fears of the American students is how am I going to be able to communicate with somebody from the Netherlands or somebody from Thailand or somebody, you know, they don't care about the UK. They, they don't realize it's a different English, but you know, it's, it's close enough. They can figure it out. But um, what the foreign students learn, and we get this from the, the surveys that we do to keep track of how people are doing when they're going through these collaborations. The biggest takeaway for the foreign students is, hey, my English isn't that bad. And the biggest takeaway from the American students is, I didn't realize how easy it would be to talk to somebody, but I did have to slow down. And I did have to watch the way that I did have to watch the way that I put my thoughts together. I had to use simple language as opposed to idioms and analogies and things like that because they don't get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so no more questions in the chat. I don't see, but I'll ask a final one that yes, your photos made me very hungry. So what was the best thing you ate in Thailand? Oh, man. Uh, we, the night before we left, we went to a, um, uh, like a Michelin multi-star restaurant that served Thai food and it was right outside of the American embassy. Oh. So, you know, I mean, it was set up for those kind of guys. I do not know what I ate. But every dish was better than the next. So, um, as a matter of fact, I gotta tell you, for lunch today, my husband made me pad thai because he knew that I was gonna come and talk to you guys. <laughs> like, yes, that's awesome. That's so great. Oh my gosh, that's that's. I I I can't decide if I'm what I'm most jealous of: the tiger, the elephant, or the food. You know? Yeah, can you believe I held a tiger by the tail? No, no, Holy that's cow. Incredible. <laughs> incredible, incredible. That that was that. Your photos were amazing, and it was really fun to live vicariously through your experience. And thank you for joining us in the audience. And thank you, Dr. Carol Scavati. That was that was really an excellent journey My for pleasure. us. My thank pleasure. You. Thanks, Carrie.
And hi, Fairhaven people. See you in person one of these days. <laughs>